All right, you guys, in our previous video, we went over the evaluation of acute kidney injury and the three big buckets that you want to be considering. But there was one big category that we really didn't have time to explore. And so we're going to do that in this video. And that's going to be glomerulonephritis, specifically the differentiation between nephritic and nephrotic syndrome. So let's get right into it. All right. So nephrotic versus nephritic syndrome. The big thing that I really want to start off with here is just kind of give you a, a picture of how, you know, these two processes differ from each other. All right, so say we've got a kidney right here, and then if we kind of zoom into this, then you're going to go see the afferent arterial going into a bunch of little circles like this, which is the glomerulus, and then exiting that is going to be the efferent arterial. So running this entire structure, you're going to have Bowman's capsule, which then leads into the proximal convoluted tubule, goes down the uh, loop of Henle, and then up the thick uh, ascending loop of Henle. Then you have the distal convoluted tubule, and then finally your collecting duct. And this is kind of the structure of your nephron. And so if we zoom into this individual glomerulus by itself, then we're going to be looking at one individual capillary that's inside uh, the glomerulus. And first, we're going to have this basement membrane, which is kind of the capillary wall, essentially. And inside here, you're going to have a bunch of little red blood cells swimming around, basically doing their thing. Surrounding this area, you have Bowman's capsule, and that's going to start draining, and that's going to be your proximal convoluted tubule over here. And then kind of on the outside, you're going to have these really big cells called podocytes. So this is going to be a podocyte. And these are going to have little foot processes that are kind of surrounding the whole uh, basement membrane. And what this does is it really helps regulate the amount of protein that's going to be coming through and uh, going from the capillary into Bowman space. On the inside, you have these really big cells called endothelial cells. And again, they kind of surround this whole membrane as well. All right, so that's just my rough drawing of what it should look like. But let's take a look at what an actual diagram of this is going to look like. And zooming in over here, you can kind of see the same thing. You've got your afferent arterial here and your efferent arterial here. This purple stuff in the middle is all the mesangium, which sometimes you're going to start seeing to get inflamed as well. And on the outside, you got all these podocytes with all their fit foot processes. You have the glomerular basement membrane, which is kind of this purple thing going along the side here. And you have your endothelial cells on the inside. And then finally, you'll have some occasional epithelial cells over here on the side. All right, so going back to our slide here, let's just divide this glomerulus in half. And then on the one side, we'll do nephrotic syndrome. And then on the other side, we'll have nephritic syndrome. So what is the difference in the pathophysiology of how these happen? So basically what happens in nephrotic syndrome is you generally get destruction or effacement of these podocyte foot processes. And that basically allows a ton of the uh, proteins that are in the capillary to leak through. So you get really, really high degrees of proteinuria, greater than 3.5 five grams per day. You get this very frothy kind of urine uh, appearance and you get very low albumin. You also lose a lot of your antithrombin 3, which then will lead to basically a huge risk of thrombosis. And you also see hyperlipidemia. On the other hand, um, for nephritic syndrome, the way that this works is that it's basically mediated by these immune complexes, okay? And there's very, various different immune complexes that can be at play here, and they attack basically different parts. They can attack the basement membrane, they can attack the podocytes, the endothelial cells, and basically this is going to cause a ton of inflammation. You're going to get a huge recruitment of white blood cells that are just going to start coming into the area, and just destruction of all this kind of membrane over here, which allows a lot of different things to leak out, including uh, red blood cells. And what happens happens is the red blood cells that come out, they're not going to look normal. They're going to have all these blebs. They're going to look like the Mickey Mouse sign. And basically you get dysmorphic red blood cells. You also get the leakage of lots of white blood cells when this happens. And basically this whole area starts to become inflamed. Uh, and that's why you're going to get the findings of dysmorphic red blood cells, white blood cells, aka pyuria, RBC cas. You will also have the loss of protein. But usually it's going to be less than 3.5 grams per day. And this really is the primary difference between nephrotic and nephritic syndrome. So knowing this, let's just go through an actual approach to evaluating glomerulonephritis. All right, so first... We can go down two branch points, nephrotic or nephritic syndrome. And for nephrotic syndrome, we're really going to be going down two branch points here as well. So you're going to have your primary causes of nephrotic syndrome, 
and secondary causes. The way you want to frame the etiologies for nephritic syndrome is slightly different. So you're going to want to do three different categories, and that's going to be posse immune, immune complex mediated, or anti-GBM. So just going back real quick to kind of the diagnostic criteria for nephrotic syndrome, again, you're going to need to see proteinuria greater than 3.5 grams per day. You need to see hypoalbuminemia, and you will also need to see anasarca, or just diffuse generalized body swelling. So the causes of primary nephrotic syndrome, the first one you're going to be thinking about is minimal change disease. And a lot of times on the test questions, it's going to be presenting in kids because this is really uh, most commonly seen in kids, but it can happen in adults too. So you have to keep that in mind and part of your differential when evaluating nephrotic syndrome. On electron microscopy, you'll see effacement of podocytes and light microscopy is normal. And so this is why it's called minimal change disease. And the treatment is going to be glucocorticoids. Your number two diagnosis is going to be membranous nephropathy. And this is going to be highly associated with this anti-PLA2R gene. And so this is something we frequently get in patients who are coming in with nephrotic syndrome. And common associations, renal vein thrombosis. So if a patient comes in with flank pain, uh, a lot of times uh, they're going to have renal vein thrombosis in the setting of membranous nephropathy. And light microscopy is going to show uh, thickening of the basement membrane. Electron microscopy is going to show the classic spike and dome appearance due to sub-epithelial deposits. And the treatment is based on high-risk versus low-risk uh, patients. So if they are high-risk or very high-risk with stable kidney function, then the treatment that's preferred is going to be rituximab. If they are high-risk with worsening kidney function, then usually you do combination therapy with something like a steroid plus another immunosuppressant like cyclophosphamide. For moderate risk, again, it's gonna be immunosuppression and rituximab is gonna be your preferred agent. And then for low risk, then usually we just do um, observation and supportive measures only. And then finally, your last primary nephrotic syndrome is going to be FSGS or focal segmental glomerulosclerosis. So focal means that only some of the glomeruli are involved and segmental is uh, describing that even in the glomeruli that are affected, only part of the glomerulus is affected. Usually primary FSGS is more likely to cause nephrotic syndrome than secondary FSGS and treatment for this is going to be glucocorticoids versus calcineurin inhibitors if they have a high risk for adverse events. Um, from steroids. All right, so those are your three main ones you need to know for primary nephrotic syndrome, minimal change disease, membranous nephropathy, and FSGS. Now let's move quickly on to secondary causes of nephrotic syndrome. All right, so secondary causes are going to be basically any conditions that, uh, you know, you have some systemic problem that then leads to a nephrotic type syndrome. And most commonly, the one you're going to see the most often is going to be diabetic nephropathy. Remember for this, the findings you'll see on biopsy are going to be mesangiomas expansion, you're going to see nodular sclerosis, and you're going to see what's called Kimmel-Steele-Wilson lesions. Another cause that you may see is amyloidosis. Remember, you're going to see apple green biofringes on Congo red staining. And then three is going to be actually secondary membranous nephropathy. Um, and generally, when you have secondary ne membranous nephropathy, the big risk factor this for this is going to be hepatitis B. There's also many other causes of secondary membranous nephropathy. For example, like chain disorders, HIV, autoimmune diseases, thyroiditis, carcinomas, and some medications like NSAIDs. And if your patient has hepatitis C, this could actually lead them to have the risk of developing membranoproliferative glomerulonephritis. And five, you can have secondary FSGS. A lot of this is due to um, a lot of systemic diseases. Uh, NSAIDs are a cause. So NSAIDs are really just not great for the kidneys. Uh, bisphosphonates, especially pamidronate, is the most commonly uh, known one to cause FSGS. Uh, and then heroin, HIV, lupus, and then really just diabetes and obesity. And uh, this is also more common in African-American patients. And really, it's thought to be due to this like chronic hyperfiltration that you know, obese patients have more protein that they have to filter all the time. And so over time, this leads to a kind of chronic damage to the glomeruli, and then you start having nephrotic range proteinuria. Treatment for this is going to be less so of immunosuppression, but kind of treating the underlying disease um, and also just reducing glomerular uh, pressures with ACE inhibitors. So again, just to summarize, your secondary causes of nephrotic uh, syndrome are really going to be diabetic nephropathy, amyloidosis, 
secondary membranous nephropathy, usually from hepatitis B, or membranoproliferative glomerulonephritis, or secondary FSGS. So let's just zoom out real quick and then take a look at uh, some of these conditions that are seen uh, on these little images here. So you see that here, you know, they categorize nephrotic syndrome based on if it is a primary source or a secondary cause. And for your primary causes, you're going to have membranous nephropathy, minimal change disease, and FSGS. Whereas for secondary causes, you know, you get the secondary FSGS from hyperfiltration, diabetes, hypertension, viruses, and drugs. Um, and you can also have secondary membranous nephropathy from lupus, uh, hepatitis B more than hepatitis C uh, and various other things like drugs and infections. And then finally, you have other things like amyloidosis. Uh, and then they didn't really mention MPGN as well from hepatitis C. This is another image for nephrotic syndrome, and they kind of characterize it based on things that affect the podocytes versus uh, immune complex de deposition or other substance deposition. But you can really see that you got minimal change disease and you have both primary and secondary FSGS. And then you've got membranous nephropathy with primary primary, which is like an autoimmune condition from uh, PLA2R antibody. And then you've got secondary causes from all of these causes. You've got membranoproliferative glomerulonephritis, and then you've got diabetes and amyloidosis. All right. And I realize it's very crowded in here, but I'm going to try and fit everything on this same slide just so everything's kind of available. Uh, but for moving on to nephritic syndrome, the best way to definitely classify this is really based off this framework, posse immune, immune complex, and anti-GBN. And the main thing to start with is to really know the different incidences of these to, just to begin with. So for posse immune nephritic syndrome, uh, that's going to happen about 60% of the time. Then for immune complex related uh, nephritic syndrome, that's about 20% of the time. And anti-GBN is going to be about 10% of the time. And what do we mean by posse immune? So in this one, you're going to be really thinking about a, all the ANCA vasculitides. So for example, granulomatosis with, poly with polyangiitis, otherwise known as Wegener syndrome, associated with PR3 and C. ANCA. We have microscopic polyangiitis, which is going to be associated with MPO and P. ANCA. And then you have EGPA, or also known as Churg-Strauss syndrome, which is the one that you see with like a lot of allergies and eosinophilic deposits and all these weird things like that. So these are going to be the main causes here. And the thing to note about all of these is that they're actually going to have a normal complement level. Remember that nephritic syndrome, as we mentioned earlier, is all related to these immune complexes uh, causing disease and inflammation. So that's why checking complement levels can give us a really good idea of how how the immune complexes are mediating this kind of uh, these problems for immune complex related nephritic syndrome. Uh, there are some that can cause decreased complement levels, and then there are others that will have normal complement. And of the ones that are, have normal complement levels, they're still immune complex mediated, but the complement levels that you check are going to be normal. And so this is going to be IgA nephropathy or IgA vasculitis. And the difference here is that IgA nephropathy is isolated to um, the kidneys, whereas vasculitis, you're going to start having you know, GI involvement, skin involvement, joint involvement. And once you start getting all those systemic manifestations, that's when you call it IgA uh, vasculitis. And causes of low complement levels, uh, you're really going to have Big, big players like lupus nephritis, which will have both low C3 and C4. You can have post-infectious glomerulonephritis, cryoglobulinemia, and infectious endocarditis. And a couple of key uh, things to note here. So for lupus nephritis, um, once you get the biopsy, there's actually different things that you're going to look for in terms of uh, lupus nephritis. So here you can see that there's six classes of lupus nephritis. And basically classes one through two are kind of mild, and you just monitor and do ACE and ARBs. For classes three through five, there's going to be progressively more disease. And the treatment here is going to be immunosuppression with steroids and mycophenolate or cyclophosphamide and calcineurin inhibitors. And then finally, for class six, where you have advanced sclerosis, the treatment really is going to be preparing for dialysis. And then kind of going back to post-infectious glomerulonephritis and IgA nephropathy, IgA nephropathy uh, on your exams and in your patients is really going to be happening about three days after a an upper respiratory tract infection, whereas post-infectious glomerulonephropathy is going to be like 14 days on average after an upper respiratory tract infection. And the reason uh, and the way you can remember this is that IgA nephropathy, IgA has three uh, letters in it. So that can remind you that it's three days after an upper respiratory tract infection, whereas post-infectious, uh, post-infectious has like 14 letters in it. And so that's why it happens 14 days afterwards. And then finally, the last one to take a look
look at is going to be anti-GBM syndromes. Uh, and so one of the things that you want to be looking for is uh, there's some ANCA overlap in about 20% of cases. So you want to get uh, ANCA serologies anyways, because this can kind of predict recurrence. Um, and then if you have anti-GBM disease and then you have lung involvement, then that's called good pasture syndrome. Be careful not to confuse this with Alport syndrome, which is a type 4 collagen mutation, uh, which basically leads to like hearing loss and also uh, can cause a nephritic picture, but it's actually not uh, one of the anti-GBM mediated causes of uh, nephritic syndrome. It's actually just a uh, basement membrane problem because of type 4 collagen mutation, which also affects the ears. So you get this kidney injury as well as hearing loss. You can see here in uh, this graphic here that they really classify things based on anti-GBM or immune complex mediated or posse immune. And so that's kind of how we are gonna be doing this as well. These great, great graphics from clinical problem solvers. Um, there's also this other one I found on Google. And so you see immune complex mediated. So you got IgA nephropathy and you've got post-infectious glomerulonephritis. You've got chronic infections and autoimmune diseases and lupus nephritis. And then you've got posse immune, which is gonna include all the ANCA vasculitides. And then here really should be uh, anti-GBM. And so you're gonna see you know, where I got this from, uh, basically cl clinical problem solvers. So they've got posse Posse immune and immune complex mediated and anti-GBM. Immune complex is really going to be thinking about like all the infectious causes, other autoimmune causes, cancers. There's so many different causes of immune complex related uh, glomerulonephritis. And so here you'll see like chronic infections, like viral infections, endocarditis, osteomyelitis, post-strep glomerulonephritis, so post-infectious glomerulonephritis. Uh, you got your lupus right here and then some more rare causes here as well. Oh yeah, and just going back to our overall picture of glomerulonephritis, uh, one thing that I forgot to mention is that for membranoproliferative glomerulonephritis, uh, you really get that kind of tram track appearance is kind of the main description that you'll see on your board exams. And then one last thing to note is that uh, rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis is if at any point you have rapidly worsening creatinine or you have crescents in the biopsy affecting gr greater than 50% of your glomeruli, then that, that should lead you to the diagnosis of rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis and basically tells you that you need to be a little bit more ex expeditious with getting the diagnosis. So just kind of summarize really quickly. So nephrotic, you're going to be looking at primary and secondary causes. Nephritic, you want to split it into posse immune, immune complex mediated, and anti-GBM. And after this discussion of nephritic syndrome, you should really understand, you know, when somebody comes in with nephritic syndrome, they've got dysmorphic blood cells, they've got hematuria, they've got white blood cells, they have a moderate amount of proteinuria. This is why we th send things like ANCA serologies and anti-GBM antibodies and complement levels. C3 and C4, and also uh, ANA, and maybe anti-Smith and anti-DSDNA, because we're trying to rule out uh, lupus. So now that you've kind of gone through this, you can understand why we send all of these um, different studies. And so that's why I think this is really important to know this framework. And I really thought that was a helpful thing. Uh, and I really suggest going through the clinical problem solvers um, resources on glomerulonephritis because it's a very complicated topic and there's a lot to learn from it. <laughs> Honestly, this is basically my current understanding of nephrotic versus nephritic syndrome. I'm definitely gonna remake this video at some point, but I just wanted to get this out there uh, right now and just get your opinions of, uh, you know, if this made sense to you, if this kind of cleared up some things. And like I mentioned in the previous video, um, AKI and evaluating the kidney and why it's not working well is a huge subject that obviously has an entire specialty dedicated to it. And so as you go through residency, your understanding of it is going to continue evolving. And it's always good to just kind of read up more about these different subjects because the more repetitions you get, uh, the better you're going to get at understanding this information. And so I'm definitely planning on continuing to learn more about this subject. And then that way, when I see this, I can uh, recognize this problem more quickly when I have a patient and get their workup initiated a little bit quicker and just really understand why we do certain things the way we do. Anyways, I hope that helped. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed and I'll see you in the next one. Peace.